Distinguished colleagues, panelists and guests, a very warm welcome to our webinar of today, Transformative City Business Partnerships, which will feature the City Business Climate Alliance. My name is Roland Hunziker and I will be your host today. I will take you through uh, the webinar, how we're structuring the discussion and I will introduce all the speakers. Before we start, just a few words about WBCSD. For those of you who may not be so familiar, we are a global business-led coalition with about 200 member companies, and we work to accelerate the transition to a sustainable world. Here you can see the logos of all our member companies, and we focus on six strategic programs that look at how do we transform these economic systems to more sustainability. Circular economy, cities and mobility, climate and energy, food and nature, people and redefining value. I would like to start just with a little bit of housekeeping. First of all, this session is being recorded and it will be made available afterwards to all those who have res registered including the slides and also some key takeaways. All participants are muted, but we do encourage you, if you have questions, to use the chat function and to send your questions to everyone so we can monitor and then pick out some questions for the discussion. We cannot promise that we will uh, be able to address all of them, but we will do our best to address as many as we can. Also, WBCSD abides by very strict antitrust statement rules. Um, so in all our meetings, whether they are online or physical, these rules apply. Please do avoid any discussion on the topics listed here. We would now like to just briefly understand with a small poll who is on this webinar. So you should now see on your screen appear this poll and I'd like you to, to just briefly respond to these two questions. How did you hear about the event? This is important for us to understand how do we actually reach uh, people. And the second question is to understand who you are. Are you representing business, a city, academia, NGO or other? And I see there's already a lot of movements. Excellent. I'll give this a few more moments. Some people are just joining, so you can also just briefly type in, how did you hear about this event? And what sector do you represent? A few more seconds, if you still want to submit. And then I'll close. Thank you very much. And we can share the results. So you should now see, uh, quite typical, we've seen that across uh, many webinars we've done, the personalized email is still the most um, efficient. And then partner networks, which is quite understandable. We do this webinar in collaboration with CDP and C40 and, and many other partners. We have many businesses. Well, out of 40 responses, so more people are now joining. Um, maybe that can still change cities and also from NGOs. So thank you. Now, today's agenda. Um, this event is squarely focused on the City Business Climate Alliance, which we are very happy to launch today and announce today with the cities that are working with us. Then we will hear from Helsinki, from the Metropolitan Smart and Clean Foundation, which represents a partnership between cities and businesses, and also the national government on really driving this agenda. And then we will have a panel discussion with our distinguished speakers that I will introduce shortly. And we'll end with closing remarks and what are next steps for the CBCA. We have created the CBCA in the belief that we need more strategic city business collaboration so that we can accelerate the reduction of global climate emissions. 
Cities are committed through their climate action plans and businesses are committed through science-based target setting, net zero commitment, and many other commitments that uh, they are making public and that they are advancing on. We now need to make sure that these commitments and the action also align and reinforce each other. And this needs a neutral space, a non-commercial space that CBCA will offer at a global level and at a local level. Our theory of change is that um, cities and business are equally eager climate leaders and they have to work together strategically. Cities are actors, key actors in climate action, and they're also orchestrators for action that involves the private sector. This goes beyond the pure relationship with business as a solutions provider, but to be really strategic to achieve the same objectives. In this neutral space that the CBCA provides, discussions can take place outside of day-to-day -day relationships and innovative approaches and new ways of thinking can be tested. We believe that this space can help bridge the gap between targets and climate action plans and the actual implementation of projects because many of those challenge current status quo they challenge current business models and institutional relationships. And so we need to really get at that if we want to drive action. Another aspect that's very important um, is that we need to better understand the commitments on net zero. Many cities are committing to be net zero and so do companies. And how can we align those commitments? This may not be the focus of today, but different actors, including WBCSD, we are looking at how can business align their commitments and actions with the reduction of emissions at a territorial level. So how does net zero for a company interact with net zero at a territorial level? This needs better data and information systems, the ability to finance verifiable reductions and to prepare projects through strategic collaboration. So CBCA will focus on action. We want to be practical. We want to be pragmatic. And we want to show that climate action will deliver wider environmental and social benefits, which is particularly critical in this time where our societies are still struggling with the consequences of the current pandemic. So today we will hear from our speakers why they see this collaboration as essential, what their expectations are and what success will mean for them, for the CBCA. I'm now very pleased to introduce our distinguished group of speakers. We will first hear from Kevin Austin, an overview of the CBCA. Tina Kehu, the Executive Director, will then introduce the Helsinki Metropolitan Smart and Clean Foundation. And then Kira Appleby, the Director for Cities at CDP, will moderate a panel discussion with Councillor Stoya from Manchester, Luca Maini, Head of Circular Economy at NL, Mariam Rocky at PMP Paribas, and also Tina joining that panel. And Pamela Jouven with C40 will share with us her closing remarks. Without further ado, I'd like to now hand over to you, Kevin, and I will be clicking your slides. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ronan. Can you give me the next slide, please? So on, on behalf of C40, CDP, and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, I'd really like to thank you for attending this seminar. It's great to be able to talk to you today, um, but perhaps in very different circumstances to what we were originally expecting, and perhaps in some cases quite difficult circumstances for many of us. Uh, next slide, please, Roland. But at, at a time when we're facing uh, health and economic consequences of a global pandemic, the issues surrounding climate change can often get lost. And we're still currently heading for a temperature rise of three degrees Celsius by the end of the century that would have an immense impact on the world's population in terms of drought, floods, storms, intense heat, not to mention the huge impact on global GDP, estimated at least 6%. So if we're to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, we have to act urgently. And that means reducing emissions by 50% by 2030 and achieving net zero by 2050. And cities as a location, given that they already hold 54% of the world's population, and by 2050 will be two thirds of the world's population, 
are really uniquely positioned to meet the challenge of the climate emergency. But also the right measures that will be needed to recover from COVID-19 are also those that will help us reduce our emissions and become more resilient to climate change. So they're both very much related. But city governments, and that's where my background is, city governments can't do it alone. You know, cities are shaped by the private sector. The private sector is responsible for delivering most of the goods and services that people consume. They provide meaningful employment for many of their citizens and they finance many of the development activities that improve our cities and the lives of people within them. And the private sector is also a beacon of innovation, helping us to move faster uh, to a much more sustainable way of life. Next slide. And this is why we're very excited to be part of building and developing the City Business Climate Alliance with CDP um, and WB, uh, BCSD. And it's where the world's most innovative and forward-looking cities are working together with the world's most innovative and forward-looking businesses. And Roland mentioned previously that the focus of this is how do we deliver action on the ground? How do we make change? It's not a talking shop. It's to make a difference and make lives better for, for the people that we, that we love and care about. And as Roland mentioned, the initiative supports joint activity to you know, align the commitments to climate action. Our mayors have committed to uh, 1.5 degrees and are delivering climate action plans. Businesses have committed to science-based targets. It's also by utilising uh, joint working to help deliver those actions. Both cities and business have a common need to deliver these things. And thirdly, by utilising the innovative nature of business to help, help make this happen. And in doing so, we can deliver a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions necessary to avoid catastrophic climate change. But at the same time, increasing the resiliency of our cities and delivering wider social and economic benefits. Next slide. And there are three types of cities that we're working with as part of CBCA. Firstly, the cohort cities. And these have been selected through an expression of interest process and will receive direct in-kind support for around three years from the CBCA to set up or further develop local city business partnerships on climate. And I don't think this has been announced, but we're really pleased to announce our first group of eight cohort cities. So Dallas, Durban, Lisbon, Manchester, New York, Stockholm, Tel Aviv and Vancouver. Really well done to all of you. And we're really very much looking forward to working closely with you over the coming years. But other cities and partnerships are absolutely vital to make CBCA a real success. We have our fellows, and these are cities and initiatives with existing successful city business partnerships on climate. And you can see some of them there in Boston, Helsinki, London, and San Francisco. And we'll hear, hear from Tina uh, shortly uh, about the work that she's been doing um, leading in, in Helsinki. And they've been invited to join our network um, to share their learnings and experience. But also by being part of the CBCA, this will help them expand their reach by working with global businesses and providing a platform to promote their activities. And then there's our network cities, Buenos Aires, Cambridge, Coventry, Freetown, Long Beach, Milan and Schwani. And these are the applicant cities that expressed an interest in joining the CBCA and we want them to be part of this. So we want them to attend the events and webinars, access the guidance and the information and be able to learn from their peers. They won't be able to receive any direct support at this stage, but we hope as we expand the scheme, we'll be able to move them into providing a, a lot more support as we go on um, with, with, with the programme. Uh, next slide. So what support will we provide for the cohort cities? Well, the team has developed a comprehensive work plan to support these cities in setting up and further developing their local partnerships. And in working with these cities, we'll also look at how city business partnerships can be leveraged as a tool for healthy, equitable and sustainable COVID-19 recovery. 
So bringing local stakeholders together to make joint climate commitments, but doing so to integrate inclusion, job creation and community resilience targets. And I should stress that given the different contexts in which the cities and the private sector operate, we can't have a one size fits all model for building a partnership. The city business partnerships will have different structures in each city based on the city's needs and the stakeholders involved. And we'll have to adapt the blueprint accordingly to make sure it meets the requirements in that specific location. But as Roland mentioned at the beginning, all of the partnerships will need to follow some guiding principles. Uh, firstly, being in a non-commercial space, you know, based on tra transparency, exchange of information. Secondly, the, the concept must be to move to financial sustainability over time and that they generate systemic transformations in the way city collaborates with businesses to create new markets, but also to build a pipeline of inclusive climate action projects. And these projects get delivered in the city. Next slide. And, you know, we, we do think this, this model will be incredibly important. Uh, the, the team at uh, um, uh, WBCSD, C40 and CDP have put a huge amount of effort into, into this to try to get it running into, into the way it is uh, today. And we're keen to grow the model from the current set of about 19 cities and partnerships to about 48 by 2023 and around 100 by 2025. And in addition to the direct support to the cohort cities, we're going to provide resources to support all the cities that are involved. And this includes learning by sharing, which will include city and business led webinars where attending cities can get the best practice advice from people in other cities doing the same thing as them. And C40's mantra is always that we say the best person to advise on something is someone who has already done it before in the same setting. So a city official advising another city official or a business um, uh, organization, someone from that advising another one, they've done it. It's not a question of a consultant coming in to tell you what to do when they haven't done it before. And this, this advice will be talking about the successes and what they did well, but critically what went wrong. And that's really important so that nobody makes the same mistake twice. And we'll also make freely available guidance, documents and tools through a dedicated online platform. And cities and business will also be invited to participate in selected events to highlight their success stories. And we'll also use our collective communication channels to promote the solutions developed by CBCA, both the cities uh, and the business and how they work together. Next slide. So just a, a, very, a very quick thing at the end, uh, it's Roland, Pamela and Kira who are doing all the work on this. They've done a fantastic job. Um, you'll, you've already heard from Roland and you'll, you'll hear from Pamela and Kira later on. But if you have any questions, these are the people that be, will be able to answer them. Um, so thank you for your time. I know we've got a, a packed agenda going forward. So um, I will hand, over, I'll hand back to Roland now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin, for this excellent update on the CBCA. And we're also happy that we can announce the participating cities today. Now, without further ado, I would like to uh, hear from one of our, what we call fellow cities or fellow partnerships, the Metropolitan Smart and Clean Foundation in Helsinki. We look at you like a model. I mean, there's no one size fits all, but we are very keen to learn. And especially how you organize and manage this partnership the results you're achieving, but also the key challenges you are trying to overcome. So Tina, over to you. So good morning all from uh, Stormy Helsinki and thank you Roland so, for your kind words and, and Kevin as well. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here to trying to kind of uh, capsulate in, in 10 minutes uh, our approach and our work. And I'm of course very happy to, to provide more information if you if you're willing to have some. Um, <clears throat> I want to thank all the uh, participating organizations, Kira, uh, Pamela and Roland, you for the collaboration so far that we've had because 
I think Smart and Clean is one of those test laboratories for city business collaboration. And I'm really, really happy to, to be here today and also very happy to, to share the ideas and give some, get some feedback from you, from you guys. So if you take the next slide, um, firstly about Smart and Clean, we are quite a unique organization uh, globally. Uh, this whole uh, thing started about five years ago when our business community in Finland uh, realized that uh, our biggest companies in Finland are actually clean tech companies. They're global leaders in many sectors, but they actually are very much in uh, focusing climate uh, solutions. And they wanted to see more collaboration, concrete projects uh, with the cities. And of, of course, then we are looking into Helsinki, that is our capital and our capital region. Um, and then we started uh, putting together, <coughs> uh, excuse me, a, a project that would involve major cities, major companies, universities, as well as the state actors. And here you can see the, the partners that we have currently. Uh, we have 28 partners um, uh, at Smart and Clean, 14 companies, uh, five cities, uh, as well as the R&D community and the key ministries. And if you take the next slide. Uh, the key principle from the beginning uh, for Smart and Clean was to uh, involve all the key decision makers. So here you can see Smart and Clean Foundation's board, which is very prestigious. Uh, we have the CEOs, uh, the, 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 the leaders from the university and from the cities. And the role for the board is to be very strategic. And uh, now we've been <clears throat> operational since 2016. And we have four years behind us exactly today. Um, and I can say that it has been quite an um, uh, evolution how we see the systemic uh, change being made and the uh, the roles from all the parties and I don't think uh, <clears throat> that if we wouldn't have all these parties in this kind of formula we would have achieved this and if you take the next slide Uh, this is our governance model, and I don't bore you <laughs> too much about the, the governance, but I think this has proven to be quite innovative, and it's actually quite uh, the key behind our success, I think, that uh, we decided back in 2015 that let's make a project that is very tangible but very strategic, like a step change in the area. <clears throat> and uh, uh, by doing so, we formed, like I said, the board and the, the governance model in a way that we have all the representatives equally participating in the project. And this means also the, the financing. So the financing from the, uh, from the partners are equal from the corporations, from the cities and from the states. And this has been enabling us to be a very neutral player. And I think this is some of the takeaways that I would like to share with you uh, from today is that if you want to make a step change in climate action or in how we do things, uh, you need to have a really strong trust among the partners. And I think this has been enabling to do that. And our little team in the foundation uh, is very neutral. And that's, I think, really, really crucial for the success. So we are not behind any, any of the companies. We are not behind any of the, the cities or anything like that. So we are really looking at the whole big picture. And if you take the next slide, uh, here we're just trying to kind of explain what we are. So our role is to, to build impactful urban solutions for 1.5 world. And this has been uh, our kind of goal from the beginning. But as, as Kevin very well put it, uh, 2018, when we received the IPCC report uh, for 1.5 degrees, we realized that, OK, we need to do more. We started 2016 at Smart and Clean with uh, very nice projects. Uh, we did in two years about seven projects or ecosystems where we had more than 150 companies involved, uh, all the cities, all the R&D communities. Uh, and we've been working around air quality, transportation, um, uh, water sector, uh, construction. And they are really nice projects. I don't say that. But we realized that if we want to make this system change, the projects don't do it. They don't cut it. 
So we have the models in place at the moment uh, that enable us to do pilots and little trials and nice projects, but that's it. It doesn't lead into the permanent change. So therefore, if you take the next slide, this has been really mind boggling. Although I think you look at this picture now and you say, okay, this is self-evident. We need to understand where the CO2 emissions are coming from. And of course, this is something that the, the experts know, but if you go to the city leaders um, and different kind of decision makers, we don't often have the holistic picture of where the, the, the emissions are coming from. So this is the, the situation at Helsinki metropolitan area, obviously heating, electricity, transport, waste are the biggest one from the sector side. But if we add the, the consumption based emissions to the picture, it makes it a little bit trickier, as you know very well. Um, we are following very closely in Helsinki, for example, the city has set a very ambitious target to be carbon neutral by 2035. Uh, but only doing that is, is still not going to cut it to the 1.5 uh, degree path. And this has been quite an eye opener for, we've been showing this picture now for one and a half years and it has been raising a lot of discussion on how do we focus on the actions that are holistic enough, impactful enough, how do, the, how do we measure them, how do we involve everybody, and that's kind of our model. So if you take the next one, uh, here we have in this pie, I would love to talk about this for an hour or so, but <clears throat> unfortunately I don't have the time. But this is kind of all the learnings that we have now gathered during the, the four years that we've been working on this uh, uh, project, is that if we want to make the transition, uh, if you start from the left, uh, you have to understand the big picture, like I showed in, in the previous slide. You need to have to utilize the data and calculate the impacts. I'm going to show you a case that we are working on, which is our kind of um, model project at the moment. You have to calculate the impact. Is this work going to lead into the emission reductions and business opportunities that we really want? Then you have to choose the right problem because this has been the, the problem from the beginning that there are so many ideas around the world uh, around the community to have nice projects, but are we really focusing on the right one? And then bringing the ecosystem together is something also that we say it's, it's a very fancy word and everybody's talking about ecosystems, but uh, the change doesn't happen by itself. So you need somebody to look after it and therefore we consider ourselves to be the orchestrator who is doing that neutrally. Le leadership models cannot be emphasized too much you need to utilize the infra infrastructure that is there really concretely. Behavior change, of course, is part of the picture. Uh, the regulation is often overlooked, but I, I, I'm a firm believer that, that if we make smart regulation, and this is where the state, for example, and the city of official roles come, come into place. And then, of course, incentives could be uh, another model in other cities. For example, I come from a Nordic country where we are very rule based, but incentives could be a, a, a game changer in some places. And then the funding models, uh, this is a really big, big, big uh, issue. And we've been talking with the EU leaders now with uh, the uh, green transition and the green deal. How do we utilize these kind of models in, in, in a way? So now very quickly, the, the next slide, if you take uh, the, the closed plastic circle is something that um, we prepared for, uh, for a year, more than a year. We talked uh, to the community, the business community and the cities uh, at Smart and Clean, what would be the problem that we all would like to kind of solve. And the plastic came up in, in a way that we realized that there are many actions and, and single things that we can do, but we need to look at this holistically. And this is what we are doing right now. So if you take the next slide, please. Uh, this is just to show you that um, currently only 6% of the virgin plastics is recycled to materials in Helsinki metropolitan region. And this picture didn't, um, uh, we, we didn't have this information before we calculated this. So it's, it's just to show you that we didn't even know how big of a problem we are dealing with. So if you take the next one. 
then we wanted to know if we would like if we would be able to tenfold the recycling uh, rate in Helsinki what would it mean in in CO2 and there you can see it's about 80,000 uh, inhabitants worth of uh, emissions maybe it's not too much but it's one th one well 10 percent of Helsinki citizens so it's not uh, something too minor so now we have an understanding what we're dealing with and then you if you take the next one here is our pie so I showed you the the green one and that's kind of the fundamental uh, principle that we are following now um, how we work in this uh, project is that uh, if you look in the center there's the main goal we want to create a closed plastic circle the whole uh, life cycle of plastics uh, need to be closed and this means about 70% uh, of the plastics are being recycled. Then the second layer is very important to understand what kind of actions are needed. So if you remember from the, the, the green one, uh, you have all the regulation, the, the sorting uh, issues, industrial processes, uh, the supply uh, of recycled plastics, uh, including the demand and behavioral change of the people uh, and so forth. And once you have these in place to understand how you need to really change the whole system, then you have to think of the outer layer. Uh, what are the actual actions to do this? And now we have um, done this for more than a year now. And there you can see the in the really outer layer some players and, and there are tens of projects and single actions being developed at the moment. And I think that the key of this uh, model or our work of doing this is that um, if you take City of Helsinki or Alta University or one of the companies like Fortum or Neste, they all have their own role to play. So for example, the, the businesses don't do only R&D projects in here, but they really think of fundamentally their business models and how they develop their business. And then on the other hand, the city of Helsinki is currently developing their procurement processes um, or how to have rules in the demolition sites or whatever. Uh, so they're doing kind of their own part, but we are trying to orchestrate all this and have the holistic picture in mind uh, together with the community. The next one. Okay, and this is just to remind you that here you can see the, uh, the potential of uh, reducing the CO2 emissions if we are succeeding in our goal. And then the next one. Then we also, um, everybody's always saying that, okay, this is really nice if you are reducing the emissions or promoting circular economy, but what does it mean in, in economic value? And now we have calculated some potential new jobs and, and circular economy value as well. So that's very important on the side. And then the next one. This is just to, to summarize the uh, uh, kind of the approach. So we are trying to create solutions that tackle both sector-based and consumption-based emissions. So holistic solutions where CO2 emissions are the, the main criteria. Uh, and then of course, in the plastic case, the circularity of material is, is really important. The business potential is, is in the core always. So we have business references for involved companies and new potential for a circular business but not to forget the social and environmental impact uh, on the solution and the innovation potential. Okay, and then the next one. Uh, I'm, I don't know if I'm uh, running late already, I'm running through these slides very, very quickly, but uh, I just want to end here because I know that there are delightfully many businesses listening to this, uh, this seminar and uh, we've done a lot of uh, studies and also our companies are very strongly now finding ways to be part of the ecosystem. So uh, my message to the companies are that you grow be better if you are part of an ecosystem and especially in the public private ecosystem, you can make a big change. So I, I really would like to thank you all for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tina. That was uh, excellent. And your focus on the systems approach and how we drive that as an ecosystem it was really excellent. And thank you for the encouraging message at the end for the businesses. Thank you. So we will now move to more of a discussion with our distinguished panel. And we'll hear 
from our speakers, indeed on their expectations, but also success factors for CBCA. So Kira, I would like to hand over to you uh, to introduce uh, all our panelists. And I just want to remind everyone again, you may uh, send your questions uh, via the chat. Please send them to everyone so that we can pick them out. We may not be able to address them all, but we will make sure to address as many as we can. Kira, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Roland. Thank you, Tina. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, we have a really fantastic lineup of speakers for you today. Um, I'd now like to invite all of the panelists um, to please turn on their videos. Um, our panelists bring a really unique perspective on the role of city business collaboration. So we've just heard from Tina Keho from the Smart and Clean Foundation, a really innovative way of working between cities, businesses, uh, universities, as well as state actors. Um, and now I'd love to introduce you to our other panelists. Um, to share a city perspective, we have Councillor Angeliki Stoya, the Executive Member for Environment, Planning and Transport from Manchester City Council. Councillor Stoya is the, is, um, her role is to drive the Council's overall policy and strategic direction with regards to transport, strategic planning and of course the environment and she successfully fronted the council's new target to make the city of Manchester zero carbon by 2038. Fantastic accomplishment. And to bring in the business perspective, we're joined um, by Luca Maney. Luca, I don't think we can see you yet. Your camera's on. Um, who is the head of circular economy at NL. In the last four years, Luca has been in charge of NL's global activities on circular economy defining the group strategy, group positioning, uh, coordinating their circular economy activities, um, and relating to the adoption of new business models um, and ecosystem transition. And he's been very engaged in the topic of cities of tomorrow. So I'm sure he'll have lots of interesting insights for us. And we're also joined by Mariam Raki, the head of company engagement projects and partnerships for BNP Paribas. So Mariam leads transversal innovative projects. She works closely across all business lines um, on uh, sustainability and uh, spearheading BNP Paribas's strong commitments there. And she also develops partnerships to work on positive impact initiatives. So as you can see, we have a really fantastic lineup today. Um, Councillor Stoya, I'm going to come to you first. And first, I'd like to just say congratulations on uh, Manchester's selection to join the CBCA. Um, Manchester is a leading city on climate. It has one of the most ambitious targets um, to be zero carbon by 2038. Um, and you're working with your business community through the Manchester Climate Change Partnership. So we'd love to hear a little bit about uh, why you chose to develop the partnership um, and kind of what you were seeking to address um, putting the partnership together. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, everyone. We're absolutely delighted to have joined uh, CBCA. Uh, it is uh, great um, that you have recognised that we have uh, made uh, strides in the last few years in terms of our commitment to climate change. Um, so, with regards to your question, I think um, it is important that um, we work together with uh, the private uh, sector, with uh, businesses, in order to um, uh, in order to deliver change in the ground and change uh, for our citizens in uh, Manchester, but also to play our part uh, as a as a as a global city. Um, what, where I wanted to start is uh, Manchester uh, has been working um, uh, with uh, the Tyndall Foundation to set our science-based approach in order to tackle climate change. Um, what we want out of this project is uh, to build on the partnership that we have already got working together with a number of stakeholders in order to uh, bring forward and accelerate um, impactful uh, systemic change projects that will see us hit our uh, emissions. 
Um, so in the last 10 years, there has been a, a period of voluntary, if you like, action on climate change. But in order to meet um, the uh, 1.5 to 2 degree goals um, of the Paris Agreement, the science tells us very clearly that we have got a lot of work to do. So our approach in terms of setting um, uh, our carbon-based targets uh, applies principles from the agreement to scale this global uh, carbon budget down to the UK and then a set of clearly stated uh, allocation principles in order to share the carbon budget between uh, local areas. It is a very practical and straightforward uh, way for local as well as devolved governments in the UK to translate the implications of the Paris Agreement into carbon reduction reduction commitments which are based uh, on the latest science. Our carbon uh, reduction uh, includes direct emissions from our buildings and uh, ground transports. It also includes indirect consumption-based emissions from the things that we buy and throw away, uh, as well as uh, aviation emissions from all of the flights uh, in uh, Manchester, from Manchester Airport. I can talk to you a little bit more about that if, uh, if the audience is uh, interested. Um, with regards to the partnership that we have got, uh, we're working together with 60 organisations from 10 different sectors and they are we are all collaboratively responsible for around about um, just over 20% of uh, Manchester's direct uh, emissions and we have influence over the 80% of the emissions and together we're working on a series of projects um, collaboratively as well as individually and uh, carbon uh, carbon uh, uh, action carbon reduction uh, action plans I think I'll just leave it at that for now thank you councillor Stoya and so I loved how you talked a little bit about the carbon budgeting approach that you took and you know, how did you explain that to the businesses that that you're working with did, did they understand that and is that familiar to them um, yes, absolutely, they do understand that and uh, actually um, they are looking, the leading businesses that are working with us, primarily from uh, um, the uh, private, of the uh, construction sector, the development sector, uh, as well as uh, other, other sectors like the cultural sector, we've got also uh, a big uh, football uh, um, uh, um, museum, uh, not museum, a big uh, football team. Um, uh, they, they are also measuring their carbon footprint. They have developed uh, themselves action plans, um, which include granular activities um, that uh, look at um, how uh, the businesses are producing emissions and they're looking then at how to reduce them. So, for example, they're looking at the businesses uh, that we're working with. Uh, the football, well actually we, we can talk about football in a minute, um, so uh, the, they're looking at the supply chains um, where actually the majority of a business's carbon footprint comes from, they're looking at energy, electricity, heating, cooling as well as improving efficiency, they're looking at their transport and logistics as well as food and after they have mapped out uh, climate, the, their own climate action pa uh, plan um, and they build an understanding of their emissions and their sources and um, then they come up with an action plan on what can they do in order to reduce them. So having set uh, the emission targets then they monitor progress. Um, the other thing that businesses are doing uh, together with us is uh, trying to influence and support climate uh, change uh, policies. So, for example, um, they're, they're, they're helping us understand what they need so that the council can potentially change um, policies, but also how we can work together to influence governments to support us in this very, very important area. How do we incentivize and how do we support businesses to change their business plans and to understand that climate change and zero carbon is integral to their viability as a business? Wonderful, thank you. Um, and we had a question from the audience here about um, when, the, when the Manchester Climate Change Partnership um, was started, who initiated it? Did this come from the city? Did this come from the business community? 
He came from the city, I think. Um, he came from the city and uh, we, we thought that as a city, working together with partners, I mean, Manchester is, is a city of partnerships. Uh, I, 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 would, I would claim um, that Manchester actually created uh, uh, the word partnership. Everything we do in Manchester is partnership. It is a part of our DNA. For example, we rebuilt the city after the bomb in 1996 with our development partners. Um, the regeneration of East Manchester, the creation of a world-class sporting campus, including uh, Manchester City uh, Football Club Stadium and uh, training around that. So we set out back then uh, looking at what, what is our responsibility as a city in terms of climate change. And we asked and we brought forward um, citizens, businesses, all of our partners in the city to work together on a vision um, uh, uh, about Manchester, a certain future. We called it back then in terms of what does the city need to do in order to support the transition into a cleaner, greener, uh, healthier city. Excellent. And now, Tina, I'll come to you with the same question. Um, where, who, would, who initiated um, the Smart and Clean Foundation? Did it come from the business side? Did it come from the city? Did it come from the state government? And really, what was the, the issue that um, you were trying to solve when it was set up? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, our business uh, leaders kind of initiated it because they realized that uh, our business community in Finland have a lot of solutions that can help climate. And then we were doing a lot already, but we wanted to be even better. Uh, and then uh, back then it was not so much about the partnerships. I mean, I can also say that Finland is a club and everybody's like uh, partners together all the time. And we are used to working together uh, between private and public sector. But, but back then we realized that uh, the businesses wanted to have business references, real international reference cases uh, within the, the Helsinki metropolitan region. And back then we were looking at the, our neighbors in Stockholm and so forth and, and thought this would be a really win-win-win situation for all. Excellent, thank you. Um, and Councillor Stoya, I'll come back to you again. Um, your climate um, reduction target, very ambitious. Um, zero carbon by 2038. How did the, or did the Manchester Climate Change Partnership give you the confidence that this was something that could be achieved in Manchester? Um, this is a very interesting question. Um, did they give us the confidence? Did we give them the confidence? Um, I, 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 think, I think that um, Manchester, like every other city, is, wants to be a, a pioneer in terms of uh, innovation, in terms of climate ambition, in terms of resilience and in terms of sustainable development. Um, we, we want to be a world-class city and uh, let, 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 let's just face it, we have seen, um, uh, we're not seeing that the, the, um, that our, the other priorities that we have got as a city are against uh, our ambition to be zero carbon. So Manchester also, like other cities, is, is home to diverse and uh, often very vulnerable citizens like refugees, immigrants, uh, low income citizens and others. So we must be proactive in terms of uh, um, supporting um, these communities. It is climate change is an issue of, of uh, social justice. So um, uh, uh, we, we want working together to ensure that our zero carbon ambition leaves nobody behind, um, builds on, uh, on this area as an integral part of our social policy, of our housing policy, of uh, our business support policy, of our young people policy. So I, I think um, having a, a history of working with our partners, it is our, it is our due to the city, it is our due to the rest of the world. Therefore, um, we gotta be ambitious. We gotta be challenging uh, ourselves, and we 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 have got to move on with this agenda because it is also a bit of a USP of a unique selling point that we have got in terms of uh, attracting foreign investment, 
in terms of uh, bringing talent to the city and retaining talent uh, into the city. So um, I think that we, we are all building um, confidence in the project, um, but also we are all challenging each other and supporting each other in terms of how we proceed, how we monitor, how we measure, how we tackle the challenges that we collaboratively have got to keep other businesses and to bring other businesses, but also to bring more residents on the same page. Thank you, Councillor Stoy. And I love what you said there about the, the social justice, um, uh, you know, piece, which is, you know, really coming to the forefront today. Um, Tina, is this something that you're tackling with the Smart and Clean Foundation as well? Well, like I said, we, we have now kind of realized that to be able to make the system change, you need to look at all the angles. And uh, we've been thinking about how to reach the community and how to involve the people. And so far we haven't done that that much because we've been developing uh, our solutions together with the businesses and kind of, kind of getting the big picture there and get the whole thing started. But for example, the city of Espoo, that is the neighboring city with Helsinki, is now very keen on working with the schools uh, and the children. So I think we are now in integrating the, the closed plastic circle into the curricula and uh, kind of working with the children and the schools. So it, it will be very interesting to see how Espoo is developing their city or implementing their city strategy together with our kind of impactful climate solution. So it's all going to be integrated. Can, can I just add to this? It's, it's, uh, I, I think this is a really um, interesting approach. Um, in Manchester, um, what we have been doing is looking at the partnership in two ways. We're looking at this, um, if you like, in a bottom-up approach, but then also a top-down and we always sort of meet in the middle and, you know, people drag us down to look at, not drag us, push us to look at the bottom-up approach as well, because this is important. Um, the the, 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 um, the bottom-up dimension is based on the commitments and the partners' commitment to do everything that they can within the existing policy and the regulatory framework. Um, so uh, in Manchester, we, we are working, for example, with the faith sector, um, but also we are working, um, you know, we've got different departments. So Manchester is split into 32, if you like, wards or areas. And every area is working together. The councillors sort of like me that represent that area work together with the local stakeholders. Um, be it businesses, be it schools, be it um, residents and, and committed com community groups to pull together a local action plan for um, the, the area that they represent. And um, if you ask communities and if you ask people and if you ask local businesses, what are the challenges that you are facing in your area uh, with regards to reducing carbon emissions? And uh, th they will tell you they will say that, you know, our emissions are coming from cars. We can see them sort of uh, trying to get into town. So what do we want to do? We want to encourage local people to travel more actively. How can we do that? We can do it by, you know, more cycle lanes. We can do it by sorting out the pavements and putting in better junctions. And businesses, for example, can say, well, actually, we've got our, duty, our, our role to play here. We know that our customers are very sensitive to this and we want sort of more action to tell them that our suppliers are local, that we are not using plastics, that we are sort of promoting clean energy. So all of that comes together in a local action plan. So while we're working with sort of the big city partnership and projects and looking at energy and looking at buildings, we are also working at a granular community level, reminding that everyone has a role to play. We think we, we, we tell our residents that, you know, you think globally, but you can act locally, therefore empowering everyone to play their part in this important agenda. That's wonderful, thank you. Um, so now, um, Maryam, I'm going to um, come to you next. And I think we've heard a lot um, around the themes of partnership, um, of, you know, having a whole stakeholder approach. 
Um, and so in your role in, in innovation at BMP Paribas, we'd love to hear some examples um, of really transformative projects between cities and businesses. I think you're really uniquely placed to speak to the role of finance um, and financing projects. Um, so it'd be great if you can touch on that. Yes, sure. Thank you so much for this uh, introduction, Kira. Um, so first, I was uh, completely amazed by the, by the project uh, done at uh, Helsinki and, and Manchester and so happy to see that uh, we have in common, uh, so much in common that I, I will uh, go through the, through the examples. So as Kevin mentioned, um, two thirds of the populations will be urban by 2050. And um, cities as, uh, as uh, Tina and um, mentioned and we saw through, uh, through their examples, we have facing huge challenges, energy transition, urban mobility, last mile delivery, or even new innovative, for example, new, new ways of farming, urban farming with the vertical farms or aquapony, etc. Um, so the questions you, you have, Kira, is what is the role of finance in all these challenges and, and especially how we can partner with cities? Um, first, I would like to introduce with uh, the European Green Deal, so Europe New Growth Strategy. Um, it favors an appropriate mechanisms to finance a fair transition. It brings capital from private sector at scale, jointly with public or even philanthropic financing sources to develop and accelerate sustainable development projects. It's a mechanism we call blended finance, in a more technical, technical concept, but it, it was more dedicated on emerging countries so far. And very recently, it has been opened to developed countries. And for us, it's, it will be a real game changer. And we are starting working on this opportunity, trying to accelerate this project where we, we, we are very jointly with public and private financing sources. But now I would like to share with you some concrete examples uh, to demonstrate what are the different roles a bank can play in this area. So I have four main broad categories. I will very, very be quick on the first two because it's where the bank is a more classical way of financing. So it's directly accompany the cities, so direct, directly financing, financing them. So we have at BNP, BNP Paribas, uh, we have our what we call the retail banking, so like Fortis uh, in a, in a, uh, or BNL, uh, and they accompany, accompany cities with several billions of authorizations to finance their project, their own project. Very concrete example, a very recent one, for example, for Istanbul. We accompany uh, the municipality of Istanbul to finance a waste to energy plant. This, um, this project was five, 545 million euro to deliver the e equipment and construction works. It will process 1 million tons of waste per annum, so circa 15% of all the city's um, solid waste and generate some electricity uh, to renewable electricity. Um, and not, so that was directly financing the city. Another one, it's more on the leasing side. The leasing financing solutions are increasingly used uh, in different ways, but for example, here with partnerships, it's called Numobi and it's a partnership on urban mobility with NG very major utility with a large European coverage, um, leasing solution on our side with the car, our valves, and as well with leasing solutions on the charging plug. And these partnerships will enable both private individuals, companies to, um, to, to use uh, more than 100,000 uh, 100, charging plugs, plugs uh, on public spaces. So that's new ways to accompany cities in, in, that, in that field. So that was my first block. Um, very quickly on the other one, so we find cities or we accompany them, but also we find we, we accompany in an indirect way, as mentioned with um, uh, earlier, with all the corporation working closely around the, the cities. An example, uh, so not in Manchester, but, uh, but uh, for, um, for, 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 for London, uh, with National Grid. Recently, um, we finance what they call the Viking Link, uh, which is um, an, a cable, inter cable interconnector subsea between Denmark and the UK to be able to um, contribute to UK government's ambitious plan to be net zero by 2050. It will provide 1.4 million households uh, of uh, electricity 
uh, and then uh, accelerates the, the UK electricity mix by re renewable energy. So that was the second one. And that's very, let's say, classical or more traditional way for the banks to, to play in this area, but try to accelerate uh, the, 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 the transition. Maybe now more, uh, let's say, the, the new one, um, that is how we can work with, uh, how we can partner and work as an ecosystem. I think it was um, highlighted before. And here again, I would like to spot two actions I have at heart. Uh, the first one, it's climate action in cities. So it's in the framework of WBCAD. It's a project with NG Tractel, Origin.Earth, and Climate Seed, which is a, a business, um, the first BNP Paribas social business. And this project, uh, very newly launched, uh, help cities to reach their CO2 target objective. But in what way? They are leveraging their different, uh, from their own expertise, mixed together, and they will identify local projects around the cities to, to be very concrete, uh, trees plantation, uh, energy efficiency, building retrofit, etc. Check the solidity of, uh, of this project, aggregate them, and then they will be validated by the third part to make sure that uh, everything is a, uh, is, a, is a very solid, consistent, uh, and, and then uh, they will be go through the platform and have credit carbon generation to benefit for the, also for the local corporates or the city or the, 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 the region. So here, both cities and companies work together to achieve the net zero emission at territorial level. Origin.Earth has very good expertise in measurement, reporting, and verification. Climate Seed, a strong uh, credit financing platform for the project and generates the credit platform. And NG Tractable, a strong experience in private public partnerships as well. So that's a way where we, um, as a bank, uh, we can also support and as I mentioned, accelerate uh, the, um, uh, the the energy transition or the uh, or um, or new um, uh, new solutions. The second one, again, working as an ecosystem, it's the Move In Lab. The Move In Non Lab is a think and do tank on urban sustainable mobility uh, to promote innovative solution. It's an engaged international ecosystem, and we have more than three hundred public and private. Uh, stakeholders in this field. Uh, we have big corporates, Michelin, uh, Microsoft, NG, Solvay, Huawei, uh, but we have also innovative startups and, um, and also uh, financial institutions like uh, Allianz, Massif, uh, or BNP Paribas. Uh, of course, Moving On is a summit, but it's, it's a, and a, and a tank, and, and a think and do tank, but it's more than that. How we can work, uh, how, sorry, how we work around that, it's on a very collaborative and digital way. We create communities of interest with a very uh, concrete issue or topic we would like to tackle and to bring all the different expertise to have a comprehensive view of these problematics. So, for example, um, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that cities are very close to this ecosystem. If I take an example, last year at, uh, at Montréal, uh, 20, um, 26 cities from all over, the, all over the world were present here, working closely with the, the corporates. Um, communities I would like to highlight, there is a community launched between Boston, Lyon and Mon Montréal around mobility data management. That's also one topic you mentioned before, um, and to, to, to see how they can work together to uh, embrace business and social, 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 societal needs around that. Another one, it's regarding e-public transport systems. We are participating to this um, uh, community to make sure that we can bring, uh, like let's say, ready-to-use solutions with all the different um, stakeholders and work with the cities. So from the diagnosis, to uh, find the right balance between uh, OPEX and CAPEX infrastructure and uh, financing. So like through the whole added value on electric buses to see how we can offer these services to the, to the city. So that was more partnering, testing innovative solutions and see how we can bring them if it works and if it, if it feels the need, if we, how we can bring them at scale. Uh, 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Miriam. That's, that's very insightful. And I loved all those really concrete examples that you gave. Um, so Luca, now I'll, I'll move to you. Um, and we're very interested to hear about your focus on the cities of, t of tomorrow um, and circular economy for NL. And for you, what are some of the best examples of um, you know, transformative projects or these uh, really uh, innovative partnerships that you've seen between business businesses and cities? Sure. We started working on uh, the vision of City of Tomorrow a few years ago because we realized that to really implement uh, a transition on this respect, uh, technology or financing is not uh, enough. You need really to address the topic of the City of Tomorrow in a holistic uh, way addressing uh, all of the aspects of the city and with a strong involvement with all the stakeholders. So we think that uh, technology is uh, a key part, but as well uh, the uh, open governance, a cross vision of the issue of the city. And uh, also we saw circular economy as a framework within which to develop all our activities. So we are uh, working in this perspective. And uh, for example, every year we publish a position paper on the, the advancement on uh, to our circular city because we, we, are, we are really looking forward to discuss and share with all the stakeholders uh, what should be the next step. The point basically it is that uh, technologies and business model financing are already there. What is missing is uh, often a mid-term vision, a strategy, line of, line of actions, and open governance. So we think that uh, the, really the collaboration between public and private is key in order to uh, accelerate and boost this transition. To mention some project, for example, one typical example of public-private collaboration is about uh, electric mobility. The mobility is a key point because uh, in the last 60 years, uh, the car role has really shaped the cities and so really to reverse in a more circular, sustainable way mobility, you need a strong interaction of all the stakeholders. We are, for example, in Italy, we are installing, installing up to 28,000 charging station by uh, 2022. And of course, this requires a strong interaction with all the local municipality. At the same time, for example, in uh, Santiago, in Chile, we have uh, created uh, the biggest uh, electric buses fleet of South America, joined together with the local institution. Now Santiago has uh, 100 electric bus and have dedicated uh, way for electric buses. The charging is done through photovoltaic. So we have created really an example, best case of uh, sustainable mobility. And this of course has been done, have been done in strong collaboration with local institutions. Moving uh, beyond uh, mobility, for example, in South America, in San Paolo, in the, city, in the neighborhood of Villa Olympia, we are uh, implementing the smart grid approach, but not just that. Uh, smart grid as an enabler for a more circular uh, transition for the whole uh, neighborhood. So smart grid as uh, an enabler for all the sustainable technologies, but as well to have a tracking of the data and as well as a starting point in order to uh, implement circularity in a further direction, building and so on. So we will try to uh, use uh, the, a more integrated vision and to involve collaboration with public, of course, institution, but as well with other sectors, because a transition has to address all the dimension and cannot be focused just on single business models. Wonderful, thank you, Luca. Um, I'm now going to move to some questions that have come in through our audience. And if you have any additional questions, you know, please put them in the chat now and we'll try our best to get through them. Um, so we have a question that came in from um, our colleagues in the Netherlands. Um, and the question is about the type of incentives that are the most effective. Um, so I'd, I'd love to hear um, first from um, Mariam and Luca on just quickly, what, what, what would really incentivize you to get involved in a city business partnership? Um, and then I'll move to you, Councillor Stoya and Tina, um, to give a perspective um, from a city and then um, from a, a, a neutral convener space, uh, what those most um, important incentives would be. So, um, Mariam, I'll come to you first on, on the incentives that would um, be meaningful for you to join a city business partnership. 
Um, mm. So I will I will answer through um, two two different ways to answer to that questions. First, as BNP Paribas providing services to the city, or as as our own corporates, uh, because as corporate as BNP Paribas, we also work closely to with the with the cities, uh, with the city. And um, I think I think it's where there is a um, a big challenge uh, to and, uh, and and where we see that we can bring added value. To, uh, to help the cities, uh, to cities' needs. I think that's where, where it starts, uh, where, where we can see starting a, a project here. Um, incentivize, I don't know, I'm not sure about, is it just in terms of uh, financial um, incent incentives, or if, it just, if it's just a, a challenge. If it's financial incentive, um, I would say, I would tend to say, I, I'm not, um, fully convinced that we need to have financial incent incentive. I think that's all the project that should uh, come here to accelerate energy transition, to tackle a uh, social inclusion, etc. there should be sustainable. And there is a business case there. So of course, at the beginning, it can help, uh, of course, at the very, very early stage. But very rapidly, I think all the sustainable business we are doing uh, uh, are profitable. And, and uh, there is, now there is no question on, around that. So uh, again, I think we need to put at scale all the private and the public financing, but financial incentivize. Um, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not fully convinced that, that uh, there will be a need uh, on, on that. And okay, I think that's good to hear that there doesn't need to be a financial incentive, um, but the, the sustainability aspect is really important. Um, but as you said, it has to make business sense. Um, yeah. So Luca, I'll move to you now. The, the same question, um, you know, what would you need as NL to become involved in a city business partnership? I agree with uh, what has been said before in the sense that uh, financial incentive is just a marginal part of the topic. I think that uh, nowadays what could be the, the main uh, 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 aspects that slow the, this transition are related on one side on the let me say the legislation and the um, regulation that are still uh, focused on previous business model so there is really the need of a transition that goes beyond the technology but impact uh, everything that's around at the same time we have still many incentives that are in the wrong direction so the, we should level the playing field because uh, before, uh, let me say, placing uh, incentives on um, sustainable technology, we should uh, stop incentives on the not sustainable technology that are in, uh, something that's coming from the past. So, and the other part, of course, is about the fact that uh, this transition, this change of under the technological point of view would require a future-proof legislation. I mean, legislation generally follow what is happening and this could represent uh, a, a, another uh, problem. So it's important really to reshape at 360 degree the playing field. In this, I think another important role is played from the governance. Because mm -hmm. for example, to redesign a city, and I'm thinking about circular economy in this more specifically, but uh, is something that maybe goes beyond how the institution, how the company were structured. For example, is a circular economy is something that is cross all our business lines. And this requires a different governance in approaching it. I think that the issue is the same for institutions because if you place it within an environmental department, you are pushing it just about waste, for example. Whereas it's something that should in, in, uh, impact on the main uh, line of actions. So really we have uh, to, to redesign many aspects around this transition where technology, as I said uh, in the initial uh, speech, in the initial part of the speech, uh, is just uh, a part, it's not the, um, the only one. Thank you, Luca. Um, Councillor Stoya, I'll now move to you and I'm also going to ask you to touch on the incentives, but also just picking up on Luca's point about the governance. Um, so what incentives did you use to bring um, businesses into the partnership and what's the most effective governance for this co-collaboration space? Um, thank you. There's a number of things. So with regards to incentives, I'll just use uh, one of the examples um, and one of the levers that we have got as local authorities. Obviously, it is our budget. So in Manchester, um, 
all of the contracts that the local authority is putting out have uh, until recently had a 10 percent um, scoring on social value so what else extra are you going to bring into the delivery of this project over and above the service that we are procuring you to deliver um, but recently we have experimented with this and we increased the social value to 20 percent and the extra 10 percent is on climate change and on environment and in the beginning we trialed this actually um, with uh, highways projects and in the beginning we were very very conscious that the private sector and the construction sector maybe doesn't understand um, what we are asking it to do and how this can be integrated into the delivery of the project but we were very very and um, pleasantly surprised that uh, the construction sector understands zero carbon and we have we did get some really really good offers from working with schools to um, reducing their carbon emissions to looking at um, sort of electric vehicles to uh, routing in a way that uh, mileage um, is kept uh, quite sort of low so now Manchester City Council has rolled out 20% social value to all of the tenders that are going out. So we are using this lever in order to incentivize uh, businesses to do the right thing and to think about how can they offer um, uh, zero carbon or environmental projects as part and parcel of what they are delivering. I think the other thing is um, more widely we've got a shared vision with our partners. We all recognise that there is a, ma a macro business case. So for example on the Northern Gateway which is another exciting project in Manchester, it's a regeneration project and um, we, 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 we are working with a proactive developer that understands um, that uh, we want to make a positive lasting impact in our communities. So, um, I, 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 I think there's a, there's a number of things here. There, there's the direct incentives and how do you use the budget that you have got in your disposal as a local authority? How do you influence budgets of partners? But also, how, how do you work with a place-based approach? Thank you, Councillor Stoya. And Tina, from you, um, if you could weigh in on the same question, especially in your, in your role as a neutral convener. Yeah. Um, what incentives have you have you seen be really effective? Well, uh, from the starting point from from Smart and Clean, I, I could only say that uh, when we gathered this project together, and of course uh, all the parties are financing it, uh, I think it was self-evident that the businesses are looking for new business opportunities and especially kind of these reference case opportunities. But it, it's it's a bit narrow view. Uh, I think. Our businesses are now really well understanding that these things take time and this is like a long-term investment to a creating new PPP models. It sounds maybe a little bit boring but that's the way it is and I think now the cities are really transforming their governance and, and I totally agree with the others that it's not financial incentives that are pushing the, the envelope but it's really uh, the uh, the working models and understanding that if if you have a business that can provide the city with life cycle approach or some alliance uh, models uh, they can succeed and then from the smaller companies for for startups and and small and medium sized companies I think they are often very alone they don't know who to contact with the city they don't know what to do uh, and these kind of platforms and, and kind of networks that we have been providing together with the bigger shoulders, uh, it's easier for them to, to come together with the ecosystem. So that's all I can say, I think. Thank you so much, Tina. So I want to thank all of our wonderful panelists for all their expertise and for this wonderful conversation that we've had together. Um, so at this point, I would, everybody is on mute, but everybody is clapping for you all. So I'll just assure you of that. Um, but I'm now delighted to hang over, hand over to my colleague, uh, Pamela Joven, who will give us some final wrap-up remarks. Thank you very much, Kira. And I want to take my turn in thanking all the panelists for this incredibly rich discussion. I must say that from a CBCA perspective, I'm thrilled that going forward, we're going to be able to work with Manchester as a CBCA cohort city to build on the fantastic work that 
Council of Astoria and others have done so far, and with the Helsinki Metropolitan Smart and Clean Foundation as a CBCA fellow, there's obviously a lot that we can learn from the projects that Tina and her team have already implemented. We said a lot today, obviously, but there are a couple of things that um, really stood out for me. The first one, and I think that was truly woven in all that we said, is the need to identify the right governance models to build a shared vision and a trusted relationship between cities and the private sector. So cities and businesses, even when equally ambitious in terms of climate action, tend to have different approaches and timelines, obviously. So making sure that we can create the right frameworks for them to collaborate efficiently is absolutely key. This is linked to a, a second point, which is the need for scale. So we know that cities and businesses are our great climate leaders. So Manchester is going to become net zero by 2038, Helsinki by 2035. This is fantastic. They have influence obviously over many assets, a large part of the population. But we also need to make sure that the work that cities and businesses are going to do together can influence other stakeholders, such as national governments, so that they can take additional measures that fall outside of cities' remit. I also think that the discussion today um, helped further clarify the role that these different types of stakeholders can play within the CBCA model and, and beyond. So if you think about business, financing climate action is absolutely key, especially since the investment capacity of the public sector is somehow limited. And we've heard about the innovative approaches that BNP and the banking sector are taking. The same thing applies to traditional public-private partnerships and integrated infrastructure projects. And again, we've heard from, from Luca on the work that Anna is doing in Sao Paulo, for example. But beyond their role as financiers, business can also play a crucial role as innovative solution providers and as direct actors in the transformation that needs to happen. And they can do this also by working on their business models and with their whole value chains from their employees, to their suppliers, customers, and that's what's happening in a number of initiatives that we'll be working with and on. So, for example, in Lisbon, with the Corporate Mobility Pact, Lisbon is one of our cohort cities. And if we turn to, to cities, uh, the same thing applies. We know that they play an all-important role as regulators, but what the Helsinki and Manchester examples show is that they can and should also act or co-act as orchestrators to facilitate climate action at city level. And they can help businesses translate their corporate commitments into local targets with a clear geographic scope. And the great thing is that by doing so, cities and local partnerships can also help aggregate smaller projects under one umbrella, which makes it easier to find funding for implementation and also constitutes a holistic approach. And again, thinking of the fantastic example that Tina gave us on the work that they're doing um, with the plastic uh, circle in Helsinki. So we're obviously going to address all of this with CVCA. And in the next 12 to 18 months, we're going to focus our efforts on a couple of things. We're going to work, keep working with our cohort cities to develop strategic local partnerships that in a few months time will lead to tangible projects on the ground. And in doing so, uh, we will also make sure, as Kevin said earlier today, that CBCA can be used as a tool for an equitable and sustainable COVID-19 recovery. Again, we've heard from Councillor Stoya on how important inclusive climate action is in Manchester and from Tina on how climate action can really help create jobs as well. So this is definitely going to be one of our focus areas. And we're also going to be working for our network as a whole. We're about to launch an interactive online platform for our network cities and the businesses we're going to be working on. That's going to be hosted on the C40 Knowledge Hub. And we're also working on a couple of deep dive webinars that are going to take place after the summer. And in the meantime, as we do all of this, 
we'll also be having initial discussions with global businesses to see how they can join the global network. Obviously, due to the current situation in the foreseeable future, most of this is going to probably happen online, but we definitely hope that from 2021 onwards, we'll also be able to organize in-person events. And so we very much look forward to seeing you there. So that's all for me. Thank you so much again to all our panelists and all the people who joined us today. And I'm going to leave the floor to Roland to wrap up the session. Well, thank you, Pamela, for that. And thank you to all our distinguished panelists. Uh, I thought it was an excellent and very, very informative discussion. Uh, today marks quite an important milestone for us with the announcement of the CTs. And uh, as we said, we want to be very practical. So please join us on this journey. Uh, it's quite unique, the global focus and local, because we need to really uh, have an exchange between those two. And as WBCSD, we have quite a lot to share in terms of collaborative solutions, because we, we want to create that neutral space for businesses to work together. And uh, I really hope that also through the CBCA, we can, we can come to scale some of these solutions. So next, please watch your inbox. We will uh, probably in two days, we send out all the recordings and the slides. Um, you can check on our website on what many businesses are doing on the COVID response. Um, and I would particularly like to mention another upcoming webinar that I think I'd like to leverage the CBCA for on those ideas around corporate mobility pacts. So it's next week uh, where with our companies we will look at how we accelerate sustainable mobility, including through corporate action. So with that, I will close and I would really like to also thank all our colleagues behind the scenes. So Claudia, Judith, but also people, our two Julias, Julia here at WBCSD, Julia at the CDP, and obviously Olivia for all your support. Thank you to our speakers and to my wonderful colleagues, Pamela and Kira. Thank you and have a very good day.